Welcome everyone to Atila's Meet the Student Night. And the goal for today is basically a chance for parents, players, coaches interested in playing varsity soccer at the university level to kind of talk to people who have done it, people who are coached at the level, play at this level, and kind of just get a chance to like ask questions and learn more about how it works. And then so today we're going to basically, we have um, some people who have played at this level to kind of answer your questions and talk a bit more about their journey. And so we're going to get started, but first of all, by maybe sharing the screen. So Aaron, if you don't mind sharing the screen and talk a bit more about like how today is going to work and go through the steps and then get to know the people that are on this panel. Cool. Next slide, please. Yes, so I've already talked a bit about this. So we have people here who have played both at the Canadian and universe, um, Canadian and American soccer system. And then we even have one of the people here, Chrissy. First, we're going to introduce the people on the panel, then talk a bit more about Attila and like kind of who we are, walk you guys through the varsity soccer recruiting process, and then have um, a small group discussion where you guys can basically talk to the players and the coaches individually. Okay, so logistics. Um, feel free to ask questions at any time. Let me just quickly open it. I just need to open up. Yeah, feel free to ask questions at any time. And then um, feel free to also leave stuff in the comment section below. And the recording and slides will also be shared with you afterwards. Next slide. Okay, so let's start with introductions. So um, unfortunately, due to some emergencies and practices, some people on the panel weren't able to make it, but we were able to get some great people here as well. Um, so we're just going to go through, and then each person you can say your name, Maybe you're, you're brave about your, your playing background, what you're doing now, and your favorite soccer player and coach. And we'll start with Christy. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Christy. Uh, I'm from Vancouver, BC. Went to Queen's University, studied business there and played soccer. Um, I'm currently in Dublin, Ireland. I played my first pro season in Sweden last year, but I'm over playing for Shelburne FC in Dublin, Ireland this year. Um, and my favorite player on the women's side would be Sam Kerr, plays for Chelsea in Australia. Uh, she can do a backflip for a celebration, so that's pretty cool. Uh, on the men's side, Alfonso Davies. And Aaron, do you mind us stop sharing your screen for um, while we do introductions so we can really get to see the, the people who are talking? Mute. Okay. Um, Christy, your friend, who's your favorite? Who's your favorite coach? Sorry. <laughs> I thought you said favorite player. Um, favorite coach uh, was probably for me, my childhood coach, Randy Hermes. She played for the national team uh, right before she started coaching us. So Randy Hermes. Very nice. Um Next, can we get Danielle? Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle. I grew up in Vancouver, BC, just like Christy. We grew up playing against each other. Um, I played for UBC, and I am currently in Australia right now, playing my first pro season with Western United here in the A-League. Um, I'd say my favorite women's player would be Tobin Heath. Men's player would have to be Erling Holland, And uh, my favorite coach would be um Jesse Simons with UBC I knew him growing up and uh yeah I've just known him a long time and he's a good coach so next we have Marty Painter <clears throat> yeah hi everybody uh, my name is Martin I'm from London Ontario uh coached both the men and the women's team at Western University which is based in London played for Western a long time ago uh favorite players uh Jesse Fleming on the women's side uh Favorite player on the men's side? I'm going to give a different answer than last time. There's so many uh, favorites. Let's go with Dennis Bergkamp, Arsenal legend. Uh, favorite coach, uh, Jose Mourinho. The special one. Special one. Uh, Joe. Hi, guys. My name is Joe. Um, I'm originally from Toronto, Ontario. I uh, I went and played at Queen's um, at the beginning of the 2010s uh, before Christie, but I also... I did play with uh, with Danielle's sister for for a year while she was there. Um, I after that I, I played in the Canadian Soccer League and uh, played a few years in League One Ontario, kind of intermittently between playing uh, a couple years in Australia and half a season in the Premier League in New Zealand. Uh, and I'm currently out in British Columbia right now in Vancouver, where I'm the assistant coach uh, at UBC, and I also play in their uh, League One BC um, affiliate team. 
Uh, favorite player on the men's side would be uh, Alex Del Piero, uh, Italian player, played for Juve for years, and that's sort of the club that I support. Um, and on the women's side, I think probably Mia Hamm. I know that that might anger a few Canadian supporters, but um, yeah, probably Mia Hamm. Uh, and then favorite coach, I had, a, I had an Irish coach who was from Athlone, uh, who was my coach in Kingston when I was playing in the CSL. Uh, his name was Colin Muldoon, and I think under him I learned uh, the most that I have under under any of the coaches that I've had, so uh, probably him. Joe, you changed your answer from last time for your favorite women's I know, team. but I didn't, want, I didn't know if anyone was going to get the Christy Gray reference. So, Christy, know that you're still my favorite. Mia Hamm is the second favorite. So, for Thanks, context, sir, for, for context, everyone who wasn't there, there was a very cute moment before the call when you guys all joined where – we asked Joe who his favorite women's player was, and he said Christy, and Christy is like right here. So that was a very sweet moment. Uh, Drayden. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, everyone. My name is Drayden Kelly. Uh, I played in, I'm from Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And I played in uh, the States. Uh, I went to Wofford in South Carolina, and then I played for University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Um, uh, played like division one there. And then shortly after that, did some pro tryouts, um, made my way back home. And then now I ended up in uh, Australia. So I'm playing for Broad Beach in Australia and um, just kind of like moving up in the leagues and we'll, we'll see what happens next. My favorite player is Cristiano Ronaldo, favorite of all time. Uh, it's more of a, it's not connected to the position because I'm a center back, but um, it's more of like a hard work and work ethic and where he came from. And then my favorite coach, probably Pep. All right. And then I think, so kind of two things I want you guys to take away from this story for the people in the audience is one, how connected the Canadian um, community is. So for example, like, and this, this happens every time you do one of these calls where like, it turns out like everybody knows everyone. Like, so Christy knows Marty from like back when she was in high school. Then Joe and Marty met each other back when they were, I think they met each other like a couple of weeks ago in BC. And then, and if I'm cutting out, let me know, by the way, it says my internet connection is unstable. Um, and then, and then I, then I think Joe and then, so now I just found out now that I think Joe played with Danielle's sister. And so I think this is something that we see very often is that the Canadian community is very well connected. So kind of just make sure that while you're going through this recruiting journey and while you're doing things, you always treat people well because, you know, word of mouth spreads very fast. And another fun tidbit I just learned is that it seems like a lot of Canadians go to Australia, which I didn't realize, but this is cool to know. Actually, maybe I'm just curious for you guys. Is there any particular reason why so many people go to Australia? Uh, weather. Mm. Fair no. Enough. Uh there's on the men's side, there's a lot of uh, semi professional and professional clubs. Uh, like, and actually, to be fair, on the women's side, too, they have uh, like WMPL and NPL on the women's side. League One system is kind of becoming here with League One Ontario and Alberta and BC and uh, Quebec and the Maritimes kind of jumping on board, too. But it's a little bit more like entrenched. Um, and that's the money's half decent as well. So you can actually go over there and play like second division football and earn a decent living. And I mean, obviously, Danny has gone a step above and is playing in the W League uh, at the moment. But I think on the men's side, anyway, that's a, that's one of the reasons why a lot of us uh, end up playing down there. Yeah. Well, thanks. Let's continue with the presentation. Um, thanks for that, Joe. Um, maybe, Aaron, can you please share your screen? And so we can. Um... Kind of go through the, the next step. Yeah, so what we're going to, yeah, yeah, full screen. So what we're going to talk about is kind of like um, trying to get, you know, recruited to play a varsity sport can be over, very overwhelming because like getting to university it's alone is very overwhelming. But then you now add on top of that, like trying to get a varsity, you know, get varsity scholarship with all these like practices and trying to get a team. So there's a lot of stuff. So we tried to break it down to a step-by-step -step process to make it less overwhelming. Next slide. Okay, so when I say we, who is we? Attila, who is Attila? What is Attila? So to kind of give you some context behind Attila, I want to give you guys a little story. 
is uh, half nonfiction, half fiction. So this is a picture of me actually when I was in grade 11, grade 12, grade 12. And this is me trying out for the Queens varsity soccer team. Right. And so, you know, I'm like the first born in my family and I'm an immigrant. So I had to figure out a lot of stuff in the recruiting journey by myself. Right. Like a lot of things I kind of had to learn by trial and error. And the thing about trial and error is that it's very expensive, both in, both in terms of time and in terms of like money. You know, you're trying to figure out a lot of things. And then on the right is is Loic. Right. So Loic is Canadian guy. Mark him. I'm pretty sure he was on the Canadian national team youth program. And he went to, ended up going to Harvard and he's actually a mentor on Attila. And he is uh, plays on the varsity soccer team at Harvard in, in the U.S., Canadian guy. And so, you know, my life would have been a lot easier if I had someone like Lowick I could have talked to when I was trying to go through the whole process of like trying to get a varsity scholarship and go through the whole process, right? And this is kind of what Attila wants to do is that, you know, going through the whole journey by yourself is very confusing. It's not clear what to do. Why do what if you could connect students with mentors that have done it before to kind of make it easier for them to know how to go about it? Next slide. And then, yeah, so kind of originally the, the process started with um, funding. So we felt like the biggest gap, and this is a picture of my student loans. Um, the program I went to Ivy Business School and Engineering at Western is the most expensive program. I had about 65 grand in student loans. And then, so the first problem we tried to solve was a funding problem, right? Which is that, you know, students need help paying for school. And this was the first problem that we solved. Next slide. And then we gave scholarships to students to basically help them pay for school. So we have about 3,000 students on the platform. 6,000 monthly visitors, and we raised about $50,000 in scholarships for students. And so this is a picture of some of the stuff we've done for students in the past. But then we kind of realized there was an even bigger problem. And I kind of realized this watching the Men's World Cup team where maybe people can drop in the chat if they know who these two players are. Does anyone know who this is? Um, so yeah, this is this is Kyle Laren and, um, oh man, what's his name? Uh, Richie Laria. Yeah, Richie Laria. So this picture on the left is an Instagram story of um of the Sigma 95 team. So I'm a 96 and I actually played against the Sigma 95 team when I was playing soccer growing up. And watching the World Cup, I very much had a moment where I was like, damn, you know, I could have potentially been in the World Cup or I could have like gone so much further with soccer if I, you know, had access to like better information and things like this of this nature. And kind of, you know, I had a little like mini, not regret, but I was like, man, I could have maybe reached my full potential if I had access to better information. And kind of the goal of mentorship is this idea that like if with the right information, with the right people kind of guiding you, every player should be able to reach their full potential. Next slide. And yeah, so kind of the way Attila works is that, you know, if you're a student, maybe you're a parent and you want to, you know, you have a kid that maybe you think they want to go to play. And even if it's not soccer, maybe they just want to go to university. Um, you pick a mentor on the platform. Um, next slide. Or we help you find a mentor that, and then you can basically book a time with a mentor so they can basically walk you through the process of how to get recruited. Or, and how to get into university, how to write an application essay, things like this. And then the next slide. And then you prepare for the mentorship session. So you tell the mentor, what are your goals, things like this. And then finally, last slide, um, you meet with them, right? So it can either be virtually or in person, but for an hour, you get a chance to kind of ask them questions and go through all the, like, the information that you can't just easily find on the internet. Um, last slide. And then so we have, for example, so Christy, who is here, and then Loic are two examples. Two examples. So the Rick Carswell part, that should not be there. That's that's a typo on our part. But yeah, basically these are mentors that have already mentored students before in the past. And if you have any questions, um, we can happy to answer them about you. Maybe Matt, you can drop a link to Christy and Lowick's um, profile as well. Next slide. Okay, yeah, so without further ado, now let's kind of dive into the player journey of what happens in the recruiting process. Um, next slide. I don't know if my internet cut out. Next slide. Okay, yeah. So basically, yeah. So this, this is kind of what the... Um, so can you go back to the previous slide? So this is sort of what you should be looking at timeline-wise if you are in any of these grades, right? So starting from grade nine, when you're in freshman, your first year of high school, you should already be like joining a competitive soccer club, right? So, you, so like if you're in Ontario, it would be the OPDL. If you're in BC, it'd be BC SPL. And maybe for those of you, because I know someone said they're joining from Halifax and people are joining from Alberta. Maybe you want to type in the chat, like, what is the highest level of youth soccer in your province? So we can maybe figure out, like, what levels you should, you should be playing at. So that's grade nine. You want to be playing for a pretty competitive team. Then grade 10, if you want to go to the U.S., you probably want to start registering with the NCAA Eligibility Center. Start reaching out to coaches. You want to start maybe having your videos on YouTube, things like this. Maybe, maybe have an athlete profile. And then June 15, grade 11, this is when coaches can officially start communicating with players. 
Then we now get to grade 11. So this is now when things start to get very serious. So this is when like official and unofficial campus visits start. You want to start taking your standardized tests, your SATs, your ACTs. And then in grade 12, this is when like at this point now, like all the work you've been doing your last year is when it's basically kind of coming to um, a pinpoint. So commun continue communicating with coaches, continue steps from previous years. And then at this step, you also want to basically, then this is now when around November is when you start getting official letters. And then the final thing here is the gap year. So this is grade 13. So very often you'll have players that, you'll have players that um, maybe weren't able to get recruited so they come back for another year. Um, and then this is kind of like kind of the timeline you should be trying to work with. Next slide. Okay, so usually when people see these types of timelines, they start to get a bit worried that what happens if, you know, what happens if I'm in grade 10, but I haven't done these things yet? Or what happens if I'm in grade 12 and I haven't done these things yet? And one thing I really, really want to I'm reassure the parents and the players here is that everybody works on their own time. And then like, no matter what timeline you're working on, like things can still work out for you. And a perfect example of this is Drayden. So maybe Drayden, do you want to maybe talk a bit about your recruiting journey and like how things worked out for you? Yeah, so uh, I actually originally went to uh, York University. Uh, coming out of high school, I was just looking around. I, I wanted to go directly to the States, but uh, it didn't work out that way because it's not all perfect. So I ended up um, getting into York U to, to be able to play with them. And um, I ended up redshirting there, actually. Uh, the coach, sometimes with that program, he redshirts his first years. I personally... It was like half of that and also uh, partly because I, I think I just wasn't really as good as I thought I was. Uh, so it was like a good humbling experience. And so um, eventually I did have the opportunity to play like near the end of the season, but I, I wanted to just take the full red shirt because I had plans and I was already messaging some coaches in the States because uh, I wanted to play division one and I wanted to get a full scholarship. So right then um, I just messaged as many coaches as possible in uh, D1, I ended up getting a little like desperate going um, uh, lower than what I wanted just because I just wanted to get to the States. Uh, it seemed like this big like promised land. <laughs> and so I went D2 coaches, uh, even a few D3 and then some like NAIA as well. Um, I eventually got like a few offers, like lists of offers, like, hey, we can do 50%, 60%, 70, 80, whatever. And um, I went down this whole list, uh, like over 300 plus schools uh, easily, just some individual emails, some like a standard like copy and paste email. And I was using like a terrible highlight tape as well, uh, which is like unbelievable. Uh, the last school on the list was Wofford uh, W. And I was actually going to give up right after, right before then. Uh, but then like for some reason, like the next day, I just went ahead and I was like, you know, let me just send this last email and sent the email. They loved my video and said that they saw some like potential. And then they offered me a full ride right then. It was just like, uh, I was just like, thank God, this is, this is absolutely unbelievable. I have no idea how and why, but it just happened that way. And so that was like the beginning of like my um, D1 journey, which was great. Amazing. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't know about that, that part of uh, the W. That's funny. Mm -hmm. And I think, Danielle, you also have a similar experience. I think before this call, you were talking a bit about um, how you originally wanted to go to the States and then you ended up going to school in America, um, Canada, I mean, and staying in the home province. Can you talk a bit about that as well, actually? Yeah, for sure. So much like in my initial thoughts or I wanted to go play D1 down in the States. Um, I did the IE camps. I was talking to coaches, but the more I got involved with those programs, the more I realized it wasn't quite a match for me. Um, there were coaches who wouldn't stay with the program for more than a season. The, the, the university hadn't been able to hold on to a coach. And for me, I needed that consistency and I needed to know that I would be comfortable and safe in that environment. So, um, I didn't really start my recruiting journey until a little bit later. Um, I didn't sign anywhere until end of grade 12. So this might be um, a little different for a lot of people because they obviously want to start earlier. But as I was looking back in Canada, um, I looked all across. I My top two were Queens and UBC. 
and I ended up staying in Vancouver, um, just staying uh, near my family, near my support system, because I really valued that. And um, I think it ended up being a really good fit for me. Thank you. Um, Aaron, do you want to continue sharing the slides? And just as a random side note, I'm actually now I'm wondering like how many, like I feel like it's, it seems like a lot of times you have the same players considering the same clubs. Which is just like a random side note that's kind of interesting. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so the, the key takeaway from this is like, you know, don't be too worried if, you know, don't follow along this timeline. The second thing that I really love to talk about is that parents and players should work together. Um, one of the things that I would like to say is that um, for, the, for, the, for the players in here, so those of you who are a bit younger, your parents will be your biggest supporter. So it's very important you make sure you're on the same page, right? Both in terms of like, Money-wise, driving-wise, talking to coaches-wise, like a lot of the times, like your parents are going to be doing a lot of the legwork. So it's very, very good to make sure that you guys are on the same page. And a good way to actually test if you guys are on the same page or not is after this call, you and your parent or you and your son, you and your daughter, each of you should write down what you think your kid's goals are, right? So for example, let's pretend Christy is my mom, right? So Christy writes down what I think, what she thinks my goals for soccer are. I already know what my goals are. And after this, we should compare them. And if they're different, that means you guys need to basically make sure you're on the same page. Because very often or sometimes what happens is that, you know, the parent want, wants one thing, the kid wants something else, and that causes misalignment. So it's very important that you guys make sure you're on the same page. So I really recommend you do this exercise. Um, there's a really great book I recommend called Building Trust with Parents, um, which is all about how making how basically kids can make sure that the parents are like basically their biggest supporters and you guys are on the same page and you don't have friction. And actually, there's a, a perfect example of this is, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? A perfect example of this is um, Sosa. Sosa is actually one of our mentors on Attila. And he actually, um, so he is a London kid. And his dad used to drive him to practice two hours there and back every day because they were based in London, Ontario, but they were practice for a team in Detroit, right? And this is the type of thing that only happens if, you know, parents and kids are both locked in and have the same aligned vision, right? So because of this, Sosa went to play for Michigan and University of Connecticut. And then his brother, Ephosa, played for Michigan State. And actually, Marty actually knows him pretty well because they're they're London guys. And Marty also, I think, coached in London. So maybe, Marty, can you maybe talk a bit more about, like, kind of what you saw and, like, maybe your thoughts on this? <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, you know, it is, you know, the support system you have around you, I think, is very important. Uh, for a lot of people, that's their parents. Uh, for some people, maybe aren't as fortunate, maybe have more challenging circumstances. But I think it's important to still try to develop that support system uh, as best you can. And if you look at um, Sosa and Folsky, uh, two brothers, they were always talented players. And, you know, they made a decision, a family decision to, you know, drive two hours back and forth to training starting at 15 years old. And I think, you know, so, so went to Mich started at Michigan, ended up at UConn, and I think Polsky at Michigan State, I think he's still there and he's doing well. So I think it's worked out really well for them, but that's a massive commitment. Not everyone's going to have those resources uh, around them uh, as a family or as an individual. So I think regardless of what you have, it's maximizing and utilizing all the you know, support systems you do have around you is, is crucial. Yeah, Marty, and actually Marty makes a good point too that, you know, I'm saying parents here, but parents can just basically mean guardians. Like, some people don't have like, you know, like have don't have like, you know, the best parent situation or maybe they don't have parents that can afford to drive them two hours of practice. But the most important thing is having people like around you that can support you in any way is the most important thing. Next slide. Yeah, so then I think there's a link to this. Um, maybe if someone can find that, maybe Matt, um, Annie or Matt, um, you can drop the link to the playbook. Um, next slide. Yeah, so what club should I join? So I think this is like another thing that comes up very often is, you know, how do you know what club to join? How do you know what to look for in a coach? I think like, you know, how do you, like, you know, I think um, Danny made an actually a very astute observation, right? About, you know, if a coach is like switching every year, maybe you join when one coach said that I'm going to give you a lot of playing time. And then, you know, when the co he comes, another coach is there and then they get kicked out, whatever. Um, so yeah, maybe like, so, and this can be both, both like at a school level, but even maybe at the high school um, in the high school level, like when you're, you're just joining like youth clubs, like what club, what to look for in a club. So maybe um, Danny and Marty, you guys can answer this question. And Danny, you can go first. 
Sure, yeah. Uh, so at a youth level, um, I stayed locally. I played for Coastal FC growing up. Um, I was lucky enough to be with a team and a coach that understood my goals and values and knew that I wanted to take soccer beyond the youth level. And they challenged me in really important ways there. Um, I think when deciding or choosing if you want to switch clubs or go to a new club or thinking about the club you're currently at, um, is, is it serving your goals and your standards and values? And do you feel successful? And, and if there's something lacking, maybe, maybe that's when you go look elsewhere, but, um, it's also important to know that you can advocate for yourself and ask your coach for more, ask more from your teammates and be that athlete who pushes others as well. Um, so overall, when picking a team at the youth level, uh, just making sure you're, you don't have to be comfortable all the time because development happens when you're being challenged. Who said, Mar, you don't add anything? I think that was really good. I think, yeah, being honest with yourself about what your goals, your objectives, and your values are is, is probably the first step. Uh, and then basing your decision off of that, and then basing it also off what resources are available around you. And, you know, for those of you who are in bigger cities, I think you have more options, uh, maybe. For some of you, that might be more of a challenge. And, you know, you're not going to be able to find the club, the perfect club environment sometimes. So, again, and that's where being able to advocate for yourself, being resourceful with your, uh, in looking for other avenues and other, and other ways you can help out because it's not always a smooth, easy fit uh, in the club system. So be resourceful. And then Marty, let me, let me ask you this then, um, like if I'm a parent, right? And I'm talking to different coaches, how do I know what to look for in a coach, right? Like you're joining the club, but you're also, you're also like kind of signing up for, for a coach. So like what what should what should parents and players look for when they're like talking to different coaches? Yeah, I think yeah, I think so. I think in a club coach again, that it would start with your own values. So if you're ambitious and you want to play university soccer or you want to play professional soccer, then you want to have you know coaches at that club that you know have those connections, uh, have shown a track record of supporting different athletes on that pathway. Uh, so I think, you know, it, it is a small world, the soccer community. I think that that reputation that you'll find from about different coaches is important. And as you were saying earlier, a lot of different people on this, this call are connected. So again, finding people who have a good reputation, who are well connected, and who are going to just provide you with the support that you need. Aaron, do you want to continue sharing your screen? If you go to the next slide. Yeah. So another thing that I kind of did to make things easier for you guys is um, I actually went through like pretty much all the soccer clubs in Ontario and BC. And now that I know that there's Halifax people here and like Alberta people, I'll, I'll try to find Halifax and Alberta, Alberta examples as well. Um, But so Ottawa South United, Coquitlam Metro Ford, Burlington Soccer Club and Tecumseh Soccer Club, they actually have like a very good like online resources section for like they put a lot of information for players. So definitely check out those websites if you want to like just find out more information online about like what does a good, like, what, what, what should you be doing as a player to play at the next level? Next slide. Um, go previous slide. Yeah, so, yeah, Ottawa South United, and then uh, I think this is Coquitlam now. So they have a very good, like, online recruitment program set up. Um, next slide. Okay, how do I get noticed, right? So films, showcases. I think Drayden said he reached out to, like, about 300 clubs. Um, I think I reached out to like five. So, you know, there's, there's, it all runs the gamut. But maybe, Joe, you can talk a bit about this too. Like, like if I'm a player and I want to get noticed by coaches, like what do you think are things that players should be doing to get noticed? I think Martin mentioned the word connected. Um, he can sort of speak to this more than, than I can just as the assistant at UBC, but just having conversations with Mike Mosher, our head coach, and and working pretty closely with him. I know how many emails he gets a day, a week, a month um, of players who are interested, good players um, and, and players who think that they're at the level and, 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 and maybe they are and probably they are. Um, but 
they get lost in the shuffle a little bit because they they're just it, it, the amount of emails that come in are just impossible to uh, do due diligence on uh, fully. Um, so finding coaches who you know we talked about getting uh, connected to a club or playing with a youth club, Coquitlam Metro Ford or OSU or one of those that you have on the list there. Those are good options because you know that the coaches there have the connections themselves and they can reach out through their personal relationships with, with, with university and college coaches and make that happen for you so that you're not cold calling, I guess, for lack of a better term, which can be really challenging. Um, I know like FTF and some of the other showcase uh, companies that are around do a really good job of promoting, promoting players and getting the platform uh, to succeed. Um, sometimes those aren't options financially, or even some, you know, some clubs do their own showcase stuff and they don't want their players to be going on to other ones. And so those aren't always going to be perfect for everyone, but, um, I, I, you know, I've been in a couple, um, I was at one in Victoria in, in, in 2022 and I was at one in over spring break here in Vancouver as well. So, um, those are pretty, you know, they get populated well with players and it's an opportunity to play in front of coaches that can present challenges too because sometimes you're thrust into a team where you don't know anybody and then you're being asked to perform in an 11 v 11 game and for anyone who's played at a decent level you know how hard it is to, to do that when you don't know anyone at all and you have no idea what tendencies are and and then no one knows what you're about either so um they have both pros and cons um i think the main thing like like i said is, is to establish connections get to know coaches at your at your club at your youth club um and and take part in activities like these like we have coaches that are here um and and i'm always happy to lend my hand and, and lend some time when uh, when, a, when a kid reaches out and, and expresses any interest uh, but i know it can be challenging when you're getting inundated with emails left and right from, from players and stuff um so i think the main thing is to get connected um and and then like i said just try and uh try and do your due diligence kind of know what the look at the look at the the varsity roster look at who who's how many players are graduating what positions are graduating if you're a striker and they've got five fifth year strikers in their team or fourth year strikers in their team there might, might be you know there might be an opening if you um if you look and you know and, and that's not the case and i was lucky enough at queens when i went in my first year we had two graduating center backs the year before which opened the door really for me to kind of get playing time my first year otherwise you're you're not necessarily um, going to get that look. So uh, do your research um, and 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 get connected to people who can actually put you in a conversation with a coach, and you're not just relying on you know the hope that maybe they they answer an email or they read an email because uh, that's not always and have nothing to do with you or the fact that you're you know not a good footballer or not a good person. It's just lack of time and lack of resources really at that at that level. So. Um, those would really be my first two pieces of advice, I think. Very good, very good. Adrian, and I would love to get your thoughts because I think you're, you, you're definitely a grinder when it comes to recruiting and getting noticed. So maybe you can talk a bit more about like your advice to someone who wants to get noticed. Yeah, um, uh, obviously, like it, all it takes is just one email to get noticed, um, but you can't just send one email. Uh, it takes a little bit more than that. You just literally, um, messaging uh connecting with as many people as possible i had like a list of schools that um i wanted to message and then i had a list of people that i wanted to reach out to and contact to see like hey this person has gone to the school um this person might know somebody that went to a school or whatever so i, I was actually uh, just reaching out to as many people as possible just like expand your resources um or expand your network and uh, network as much as possible. I, I think that's really important because you, you never you never know who's connected to who and and whose brother used to play and this and that, you know? So uh, you'd be surprised, right? When you just start sending a bunch of messages saying like, hey, I'm interested in this. Like you gotta put it out there and uh, a lot of things will come back your way. Cool. Um, so you, Aaron, you, you don't have to share your screen for this, but I think I can just read off the questions. Um, the next question here is um, how to how to impress coaches. So maybe, I mean, we kind of already talked about this, but maybe like I'm trying to think about this more from the lens of what like what is it that you look for in players, right? So maybe Marty, you can answer this question. Like, you know, when 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 a player 
like I, I don't know if this is like like um but i know for example like when when for example like let's say someone like christy right when you know you you know you guys went out for lunch for the recruiting trip and stuff like this is like what is it that you saw in someone like christy that you said okay let me invest time and like actually kind of <laughs> i think christy's blushing a little bit right now but like what is it like when you see a player that's like very talented right like what is it that you see in them that says okay like this is someone that i'm going to invest time in i really want to have get them to join our team and they stand out to you yeah i think every coach will be a little bit different but I mean, you know, so you're going to notice the obvious attributes of the player, right? So this, the actual soccer playing attributes, which again, different coaches will value in, in slightly different ways, depending on their game model and things like that. But then I think the one area that, that you could separate from is really showing, uh, you know, that you're really interested in the school, um, you know, because as, you know, Joe was saying, there are a lot, a lot of athletes that contact us that, that want us to look at them and things like that it's the athlete that shows that they're actually serious about the school they've done some research into maybe your soccer program but also into the academics and it's you know they've shown that they have that you know real interest I guess is, is one area you can separate yourself and then in terms of your playing attributes it's just you know that's it's going to be a does the coach think you're, that they're going to be a player that can help them win? And, and when you saw a player like Christian Acci, saw Danielle as well, and probably reached out to her. I don't know if she got back to me, but uh, she you, see players, one, right? you see players like that, it's, it's just the coach is going to say right away, that player can step in, can play, can, can, and can help us win. And that's, that's kind of maybe, and sometimes that's the first step, but a lot of times that's not the first step. A lot of time the first step is, just the player reaching out, establishing a relationship, making us want to watch them, and then we watch them and we see what see what they're all about. Very well said. Very well said. Um, and actually, I'm just personally curious, uh, Marty, for you, like, how much recruiting do, of your recruiting is like Ontario versus like BC? Yeah, and again, every school will be different. So I think again, when you're doing your research in the schools, look at the roster. That'll give you some kind of a hint. Uh, Western's an interesting school because it's a uh, you know we recruit nationally. Uh, with limited resources, which means it's actually quite a challenge for us, especially since we're recruiting on both the men's and the women's side. So, you know, Joe alluded to that earlier. Um, you know, so we have end up with probably about two thirds of our roster would be Ontario. One third of our roster would be very local, like within half an hour. And uh, one third of our roster tends to be uh, from the rest of Canada. How about for you, Joe? What's it like at UBC? Yeah, I think having the we basically share like certain training facilities with the with the Whitecaps. Um, so we a lot of the a lot of the Whitecaps youth players, and there's a good rapport with the coaches and um, from across the club to the to the university. So um, on the men's side, anyway, there's quite a few Whitecaps players who kind of jump over to um, to playing in the in the men's team. There's uh, there's a few a handful of internationals, like three or four international players. And there's maybe two or three from Ontario, but for the most part, we're predominantly like a British Columbia based um, team on the men's side anyway. Um, I think Danny can probably speak more towards on the women's side, what that kind of looks like breakdown wise. Um, but yeah. Very cool. Yeah, go ahead, Danny. Yeah, on the women's side, pretty similar. Um, we, there's a lot of girls locally. Um, like my recruiting class that I came into were all from the BC area, but we do have players also internationally, girls from the States, um, all across, a lot from Calgary, a lot from Ontario, stuff like that. So we're not as limited as maybe some places are, but um, definitely you see a lot of uh, homegrown BC girls come up through UBC. And actually, I'm going to talk a bit more. I think one interesting thing, I think Carly thinks that she's a coach of Brock, women's coach. And I think um, she is from BC. She had some interesting insights about scholarship numbers, like differences between BC and Ontario, which I'll talk about later on. Erin, do you want to continue sharing your screen, please? Yes. Yeah, so on the topic of emails, um, so Quinn actually has a very brilliant email that he gave us as an example of what you can use. Um, when you're sending, um, when you're emailing coaches. So this is an example of like kind of, and then like, I really like Martin's point about like showing interest. And Carly talked about this too, like something as simple as like using the coach, like using the coach's name in your email, mentioning like very specific facts about the school. 
is a really good way to because again these coaches get a lot of emails and they basically want to know that like you kind of basically wrote this email just for them and not just like a random email blast and it's like this is a very good example that you can use and then we'll send a link to okay perfect matt's already sent the link so you can sort of use that link um as an example for when you're sending emails next slide please so how do i decide what school to pick i think we've already covered this point um so we can go to the next question what i need to know about scholarships so i'll make this one more of an open-ended question if between christy Drayden, i feel like Drayden probably might have some experience here uh martin joe if any of you have you know insights on like scholarships what students need to know about scholarships i really actually maybe Drayden, you can talk more a bit more about your like 60 70 80 percent thing you were talking about yeah it seems like um like some schools have more money uh, to spend on internationals uh, than others or, or are willing to spend more, sorry, um, because, uh, it, and depending on the time of year as well. So I was actually messaging uh, coaches in schools um, very late. Like it was like maybe, ooh, I, I want to say April-ish, like somewhere around there, very, very late. So all, a lot of the full scholarships were already like allocated uh, to players for the next season right um so that like that took a little bit extra luck as well uh well luck or like a, a blessing in disguise but um i i would i would definitely say that some schools are willing to take a chance on you uh it just it really depends on how you email them how you reach out to them um but that 60 70 yeah some schools were just willing to pay for like 60 percent of the tuition uh some were willing to pay for just room and board uh, some were willing to pay for um, nearly all of it, like 80%. That was the highest. That was like, I remember like University of Niagara, that was like the first time that I got like a really high one, which is 80%. I was like, oh, shoot, like, I don't know where I'm going to get the rest of this, like $10,000 at the time, but 80% um, sounds amazing. You know what I mean? Uh, but then I had to continue to look for someone that was willing to do like the full, like 100%. I want 100% to be able to make this uh worth it to go to the states for me at the time but yeah it, it really just depends on the school and the timing like if you start to message schools now for 2020 uh 2025 you're in luck but if you're messaging schools um in like august for this upcoming season then you're kind of out of luck well not out of luck but it's a little harder you know and then i remember in the last um meet the students night we did Ashley had an interesting point about, I think, negotiating about, she was talking about how, like, um, I think her and her dad were, like, kind of negotiating, like, with school for, like, okay, can you give us more about more money for this or for that? Like, I, from what I understand, this is more of an American thing than a Canadian thing, but maybe, Jordan, you can talk a bit about, was there, like, any negotiating with schools and, about stuff like this? So when I was first trying to get into a school when I was leaving York, uh, so for my first D1 school, uh, there wasn't room for much, much negotiation. Like I, I didn't have enough like power. Like I, I had like a poor quality video and I had just registered a season. So there's not really much you can say, just you're willing to go for nearly anything. But then after Wofford, when I was going to the second school, uh, UTRGV, um, since I had already like created this great like report for myself, had a great, um, great stats everything like that good video as well uh and somebody that was vouching for me like helping uh reach out to these schools for me as well um it was a different like supply and demand like these schools actually wanted me on their team so it was different and we could negotiate hey yeah like can i get this room instead of that room? like the, it was a whole different ballgame then um i got it i got an anonymous question Somebody wants to know um, why Christy chose uh, Queens over Western. Um, that's a tough question. I think um, for me, like my, I had a lot of family who went to Queens. I mean, actually my dad went to Western, my mom went to Queens. So natural divide in the house. Um, but yeah, I had uncles and other people who also went to Queens. Um, and for me, when I went there, I think the program more so aligned. Um, Marty talked about like how program and obviously soccer program, you're there to study and play. And for me, like the 
business program more so aligned with what I was looking for. Um, Ivy, obviously you have to do your undergrad, as you know, you did Ivy um, for your first two years and then you transfer over. And I liked how like the commerce program at Queens, you kind of dove right in. Um, and yeah, Danny's sister and some of the other players, Danny's sister actually gave me my tour at Queens. The soccer world's very small. <laughs> um, yeah. And it just felt right. I don't know. You can't really describe it. I really liked Western as well. Um, it was a very close second. So um, I think overall it just felt right. Sometimes you just know when you're on campus and I definitely had a natural bias from family, but that's my answer. You know, it's funny you say it because of the program, because I, so I was also recruiting for Queens and Western as well, actually. And I got into both, but I chose Western for similar reasons as uh, actually. So I did the Ivy business and engineering program. And the reason why I chose Western was because with Queens, you had to pick one. So you either had to do only business or you had to do only engineering. But I kind of wanted to do both business and engineering and Western gave me that option. And I think from a soccer perspective, for I don't know if, for, if any of you are like deciding between like um, Queens or Western or even like schools like UBC, like very often, like these are all like really, really good programs. And then so like you kind of really can't go well. And I, and I like Christy's point about like often it's more of like just like a vibe. like. Fit. Um, someone asked a question about FTF, thoughts on FTF and if it is worth attending. Anybody want to answer that one? Um, I can speak just quickly on it. I think if you don't have any starting points and you're really starting from square one, like you don't know anybody, maybe you're the first person in your family that's tried to go and do something like this and you're, you're maybe the, the club that you're with has maybe that can really help. I think FTF is good in that regard. Um, I think that they, like I said before, kind of offer a platform for players and uh, make the um, the highlight tape and make the introductions with coaches and those sorts of things maybe a touch easier. Um, if your if your club is doing a lot of the, or they know coaches and they know people in the industry that are at the university level, um, then I don't think. It's probably somebody on FTF that's here that's going to, I don't know. Um, but I don't think that there really is, it's a necessity. Um, I do think that it's good. I guess that if you're kind of starting from square one, you have no real understanding of things and your exposure levels are quite low. But um, if you have people who are doing the light work, if you have somebody who can do a highlight tape for you yourself are good um, with video cameras and those sorts of things, you know, being coming a bit more of a norm now, um, if you can do it on your own, then, um, then yeah, I don't think it's it's necessarily worth it or a necessity. I think it does help if you're kind of you got really nothing going for you otherwise. I think Marty, you're going to see something as well. <clears throat> yeah, I think FTF, uh, from my point of view, is is very reputable. Does a really good job. Um, you know, there's some people who contact college coaches that after a couple of times they recommend someone and the player doesn't end up being what they recommended that you don't listen to them. But I'd say FDF, very honest and have really good relationships with, with tons of university coaches in the States and in Canada. Uh, and they're people that are listened to, um, I think for good reason, they're not going to, you know, dress you up and make you a player that you're not though. So I think if you go to an FT event, FDF event, you know, it's, it's going to help promote you if if you're at that level it, it's it, they're not going to you know like i said they're not going to make you something that you're not already it's just a, it's a way to help make yourself visible um to, to a bigger connection of people because they are very well connected and, and very like have a good reputation aaron can you um share your screen let's go on to the next question i believe there's some yes yeah, scholarships here yeah, we're going to talk about scholarship numbers yes so this is something that's kind of really cool to, to know. Um, scholarship numbers, yes. Yeah. So kind of, you know, another reason why the States is kind of, you know, a lot of people look at the States is because they offer like full ride, like in can Canadian schools. So yeah, so, okay. So maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, Joe or Danny. Um, so Canada West also offers full ride based on if I recall correctly. Yeah, from my understanding, there's no limit on um like you have in ontario with the forty five hundred dollars i believe it is now mm -hmm. uh, i don't believe that limit exists in uh in british columbia no but obviously you know unlike uh some of the big div one programs in the u.s who have like an unlimited coffer to kind of pull from um you know it, 
it's still not going to mean that everybody on your 24 person roster or 26 person roster is going to be on a full ride uh, scholarship. Those are still given based on a lot of merit and, and the availability that's there. Um, but yeah, if, if I'm not mistaken, there is no, uh, you know, dollar amount limitation in Canada West. And this is actually a good point um, because even, even in the States, right. We talk a lot about like these, these big D1 programs for right scholarships. Um, it's 9.9 full ride scholarships. So if you have a 30 person roster, 9.9 scholarships, basically only a third of the people are going to get full rides. And even then, um, what was discussed in the last session is that probably only like maybe three players will actually get a, a full ride. Everyone else is basically going to be like sharing, you know, the 6.9 shared amongst like maybe 10 or 20 players. And so often this is why people end up stacking like academic with athletic scholarships and like merit-based scholarship. And then another thing I always like to encourage students is that you know, and especially when they like about Canadian schools, but just in general is that this is why it's good to be a well-rounded student. That way, if you can't just get a scholarship for just athletics, you can also get some scholarships for academics. And also what a lot of schools will do too, is that if they really want you in the program and they'd be like, okay, we don't have enough budget for like, and this is actually how I got some scholarships at Western too, right? Was that like, I didn't get, I got maybe like a couple of thousand for, for the soccer team, but then the coach also helped me get a couple academic, um, like academic scholarships through the varsity team based on my grades. Right. So this is another thing you want to keep in mind as a student is that, you know, you want to basically be able to make, basically be able to get pull money from different places. Next slide. So a great example of this is Rena. So Rena is a U of T student. She played U of T engineering and varsity soccer. So U of T very academic rigorous program and then engineering also rigorous. And she got a lot of scholarship, but hers was actually a lot of it through um, academics. And she only got one scholarship, which was the BC Soccer Scholarship. And this is another piece of advice, advice I would give people is that if you're playing for like your local club, very often your clubs will also have scholarships for students. So make sure like if you're playing for BC Soccer or Ontario Soccer, or Alberta Soccer, see if your sports association has scholarships because they usually give scholarships for people in their club as well. The next slide. Um, transition to university soccer. So maybe, um, Christy, you can talk a bit more about this. Uh, maybe you can also talk a bit about like um, one thing that comes up a lot is that playing time. So a lot of times people will have questions about, you know, maybe they're starting all the time in high school, get to, get to university, they're riding on the bench. Sometimes people see their grades drop. And I know you, you played as a captain as well, too. So you maybe talk yeah, about that. transition. Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit, uh, especially because, yeah, so... I I guess once you get to university for most players, you're all of a sudden surrounded by a bunch of you. So everyone was sort of like the goal scorer or whatever in their high school team. If you get to that point, um, you kind of hit a reset button, which is awesome because it's in a way a fresh start, new coaches, new perspectives. Um, but it can also be really tough the first year. Like I wasn't someone who walked in in first year and started any games, actually. Um, I struggled. I didn't even dress the first few weekends um and you know what I mean it was definitely a slower start it took transition but I think it's important that like you have to allow yourself time first of all to adjust both to like the academic load you're all of a sudden surrounded by say 30 talented players who are all coming as like say maybe the top players at their club um and you sometimes take more time to grow into that role and just to be patient with yourself so transitioning both like for myself I moved across the country so from Vancouver to Kingston it's a five-hour flight and two-hour train from home so you're adjusting from being away from family harder school and you jump right into season you arrive in August for training camp so I think just being ready to work hard and have an open mind and things can change injuries happen and the season progresses quickly and then all of a sudden you're in playoffs and maybe you, I remember starting to play a lot more um so I think just being patient with yourself and allowing yourself to really grow into the role, obviously like second year, third year, fourth year, and I stayed for an extra semester. Um, things as you continue to work hard can change and work in your favor. Um, but I think it's just really important that once you're at university, like you were talking about, it's important to be well-rounded and focus your energy in school. Cause obviously in order to often maintain a lot of these scholarships, you have to maintain your academics as well. Um, and so speaking to, yeah, and just touching on the scholarship, but a, a little bit, um, I think it's important for those, especially looking to stay in Canada, being a well-rounded student is super, super important because there isn't always that unlimited culture of money. Some schools and conferences have that, but obviously the OUA is capped, say, when I was there, is at 4,000. 
Um, and the people who get that, it's like maybe a few on your team. In my program, like the business program was like $17,000 a year. So that's a lot of extra money. So I think just being a well-rounded student helps you collect sort of those um, scholarships maybe in other areas. And I think just being patient with yourself uh, throughout the experience and leaning on like your upper years as well. Um, and I think just in terms of balancing both academics and extracurriculars, it's important to try and get involved uh, as best you can and make the most of the full experience. Um, but just being patient with yourself and knowing that it's going to take hard work and transition in a lot of areas beyond soccer. Maybe Danielle, you can also, and actually I have to say, I didn't even know that Danielle was a captain of the BC soccer team until I saw the armband in one of the pictures. And so I have to give a huge shout out as well to Aaron for finding Danielle, because that was that was a really good find. Yes, yeah, so maybe Danielle, can you talk a bit about that, that transition, what it's like playing at the university level? Right, I think Chrissy put it really well. Um, but in in my experience, it, def, definitely leaning on the older girls, because if you're going through something you're finding difficult, odds there's someone on your team who has been through the same situation or knows how to handle it. Um, I know I really had to adapt with my time management. That was something that came along in the process and maybe isn't even perfected yet, but uh, definitely you, you learn as you go. And every year it can be different. Every year there's going to be new players coming in, new things to adjust to. And um, at, at the end of the day, it's it's something you have to enjoy. It's always about enjoying the process. And um, I mean, I stayed closer to home. I didn't ha really have to adjust too much to to leaving what I was used to, but um, it it would still scary. It can still be scary, but it's important to voice those concerns because there's going to be someone, your family, your coach, your teammates there to uh, support you as well. And then the next question in this process is transferring, right? So we've talked about high school, we've talked about transition and then transfer process so one thing so and actually I, th I feel like this is a very American concept and I have some theories why but I'll let Jordan go I noticed that me Christy Joe Danielle we all stayed at one school all, all, all four years I was in school for six years um, but most of us stayed in the one school in our entire university process um, but I noticed a lot of Americans like Quinn Drayden basically a lot of them transfer schools so maybe Drina, hey, can you talk a bit more about like what's the transfer process like? And then why do you think it's so common for people to transfer schools, especially with the American schools? I think, well, first off, I think it's um a really good idea. If you can stick with the same school, um, that's a great idea. Uh I transferred um just out of like the need in those times because like I went to one school and then I wanted to actually play division one. So then I went to the division one. And then I had graduated from Wofford. And so that's why uh, I transferred. And I still had that one red shirt year left. So I had already graduated, did my four-year undergrad. And so uh, when I went to UTRGV, that was the master's program that I had started. So that's why I did that, uh, that final transfer. But um, the transfer process is, um, it can be a little hectic because you have to catch it at the right time as well. Um, and because of that, uh, you've, you've got to kind of like build up your own resume, um, uh, playing resume during the year to make sure you're like an important transfer, you know, so you can get like the, the price that you want. Um, but uh, as for teams that are like actually interested in everything like that, like once you actually become that person that the teams want, uh, then the conversations get a little bit easier. I think that there's a transfer portal now. Um, in my last year, like leaving from Wofford to TRGV, there was this new transfer portal that they were starting up. And so right away, right when you want to be transferred, then you kind of like declare that and then you're automatically just put into that portal and all these coaches can already see you. So you don't like there's not too much like reaching out like you can still reach out and everything. And then um, and, and coaches will also see you already in that transfer portal. Is, is that still around if anybody knows? I think you're the only one. I don't know. I think you're the only one who played in the U.S. here. It, oh it okay well yeah i'm pretty sure the transfer portal has gotten even it's gotten even crazier it's uh and it's so it's for ncaa athletes and it's it's now i mean just the one big difference between canada and the united states that, that would affect transfers 
is in Canada, if you transfer schools, unless it's for a gra postgraduate program, you have to sit out 12 months. Okay, so and in an NCAA, you do not have to do that. You used to have to ask for a release from your coach. Coach, Now it's automatic. Uh, so that's one big difference. The other thing is coaching turnover in NCAA is, is a lot more frequent than in Canada. Uh, and that can affect why, whether a player wants to stay. And it can also affect how scholarships are promised and honored. Um, so if different schools cut scholarships and different coach comes in and wants to use a player in a different way, all those things can make an impact. And then that's actually one thing yeah. I was, go ahead, Drayden. No, I, I've, I've heard about that as well. Like where, um, say for example, you were promised a scholarship uh, going into the school and then the coach just happens to switch. And then uh, the new coach comes in and he, they don't always have the same thinking and he doesn't have to honor the last coach. So it just depends. And then this actually brings up another point too that um, I think another big difference between American and Canadian schools is that I think for Canadian schools, like the scholarship is almost like, it's like a nice to have where it's like, you know, maybe you've already, like you're already going to pay your tuition and the, the scholarship is like, a, like something to make like, like lighten the load a bit on your tuition. But in America, especially for a lot of Canadian kids, like their scholarship is basically how they're able to afford the school. And then, so like Quinn talked about this when he was here that like, so if you're going to like a $20,000, $30,000 school and they're giving you a full ride, and you're paying international student fees and all this other stuff, if they take away the scholarship, you pretty much can't afford to go to that school anymore, right? So this is why you see a lot of kids that kind of come back when the scholarship money runs out. So this is something to keep in mind too, is that like a lot of times they give you a full ride, but it's only, it's like, it's it's on a um, at will, it's at will. So if you're not performing, then the next year the scholarship is gone, you have to figure out how you're gonna pay. And then the final part of this panel before we go into the breakout rooms is, um, Life after school, right? So we have, I think now, I think every single person on this panel, I think played pro or semi-pro at some level. And then maybe you can talk, talk a bit about what's this process. Like, I'm even I'm even curious, like, because for me, right? Like I, I retired from soccer at like first year or second year, but then some of you kind of are keeping the, the dream alive for longer. And so like, what what's that process? Like, what's that, you know, like that, like what's that conversation with yourself? Like where, okay, I'm going to hang up my boots or no, I think I have a couple more years in me, finding an agent, getting recruited, things like this. And maybe Christy, you can go first. Yeah, I can jump in. I think specifically on the women's side, Joe, maybe you can touch on like the men's side after. Um, but I guess for Danny and us, on the first few years of university, like I didn't actually think playing pro or beyond university was a possibility. Obviously, the rise of women's soccer and professional opportunities is still fairly new and exciting. Um, like even for me playing in Ireland this year, it's the first year it's officially a pro league for women, the top division. Um, so I think towards the end of my career, I definitely had ambitions to play. Um, and it's definitely not a straightforward line. I think there's tons of options, obviously, when you graduate, whether that be entering through coaching or staying involved in the game in different ways. Um, but yeah, I started my journey off through like many emails. You can try and work with different agents. I initially started working with an agent who helped me get over to Sweden. Um, anyways, I had a great season or a fun season over there. Um, but obviously sometimes agents move on and can cause different complications in certain ways. So I think a big important thing is to be able to learn how to brand and stand by yourself. So talking about good highlight videos, someone was chatting about in high school, it's just as important when you want to continue and play after. So making sure you do your due diligence, keep track of your film, um, and keep in touch with people. The soccer world is small, even internationally, uh, reaching out to people, uh, especially like Canadians who are overseas. I think there's just over a hundred girls who play professionally, Canadians all over Europe, reaching out to people, asking about their experiences, where they've enjoyed playing. Um, and a lot of it's trial and error. And sometimes you just have to get over here for your first contract at the first pro contract under your belt. And then that'll continue to open doors for you. Um, but I think for me, I just want to keep playing as long as I can and we'll do what I can to keep that going. But it's definitely not been a smooth and easy process. Like I think maybe sometimes I know I've chatted with Joe about this. I, I trained while I was on exchange in France. So I was training with the team while I was there. And I remember we chatted Joe like that was years ago, I guess now in 2020, just about our experiences. It's not straightforward. I think it definitely makes things a little bit complicated sometimes coming from Canada. Um, 
just you have to bet on yourself at the end of the day. And I think it's possible, like even uh, chatting with other friends and Canadians who have gone on afterwards, sometimes you take trials like I went on a trial in Spain, doesn't work out. You have to hit the reset button, continue believing in yourself, then ended up in Sweden. You know what I mean? Came here through all eggs in one basket. Trial went well. Well, I'm still here. So I guess that's OK. You know what I mean? But sometimes you just have to bet on yourself um, and be nice and be kind to the people around you offer to support and give back to other people because it's like even doing things like these mentorship sessions and I, I mean if anyone ever has questions my door is open because I've chatted with tons of people who have helped me along the way and I think it's important especially like within our Canadian community to help out the other Canadians who want to do the same so I think long story short uh, after university there's tons of options and ways to stay involved with the game obviously if you can stay and continue playing that's the dream um or whether that's other avenues like coaching um or entering like say business or other worlds um but long story short I guess that's my journey post university my door is always open if anyone wants to chat or yeah I mean I'll uh I'll kind of just feed back on that and I remember very vividly when I was at Queens I was doing uh one of the one of the tours that Christy was signed with Akira had did for her. I was doing a, a tour with, this, with with seven or eight recruits in my last year, um, and I remember there was a kid who was a Croatian guy, Croatian dad, and his that's our head coach. Um, how many players have gone on to play pro after being here? And our coach laughed out loud and said, "No one goes and plays pro after playing in university in Canada or Queens." And I remember being like annoyed and angry that he just like quickly dismissed it as like, well, once you come to Queens, you're here because of academics, you have a degree from Queens and that's what you're going to use. Um, and I remember thinking like, that's, that's not, that's kind of a cop-out answer. Um, I remember, I mean, it sounds really, super cliched, but like the love of the game kind of keeps you going. Um, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Like unless you're, and I, I mean, you guys that have you, we have Drayden and Danny and Christy that are all kind of exploring this as we're talking now. But to think that pro football is like extremely glamorous and you're driving around in a Rolls Royce and you're, you know, like being mobbed by fans. It's not like that for 99 percent of the footballing world. Like it's a it's something that you do because you enjoy it. Yes, it helps pay, it, you know, it pays some bills, but at the end of the day, like that's what it really does. Like it pays bills. It's not, you're not, no one that I know specifically is getting loaded off of, off of a football wage. No one's, no one's raking in the dough like Cristiano's contract in Saudi Arabia. Like that's a, an anomaly. Um, so I think there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a misconception, I think, with what professional soccer looks like for the majority of people. Um, and for the majority of people, like it's a job and we do it because we really love doing it. Um, I don't think that any of us could, you know, we all have degrees from reputable institutions, but we're still trying to me. So maybe less so, but like you guys are trying to, to pursue it and continue on with it. At any point in time, you guys could use your degrees and probably earn more money and have more stability and not feel like you're going here, there and everywhere to try and eke out a living to play. But because you love it so much, you're doing it. Um, so for me, it's like, it's, it's a marathon and not a sprint. Like it's, it's a bit of a battle of attrition. Like the longer you keep at it, the more you want to continue at it. And, you know, I'm 30 now and still, I'm still playing with guys that are like literally a decade younger than I am. Um, but it's, it's what I want to keep doing. And, and so I'm still able to, but um, as soon as that love of the game and that drive kind of stops, it, you, you don't make enough the majority of the time to just do it and go through the motions. Like it's really something that you really want to do with because you love and you, you enjoy the grind and you enjoy betting on yourself, like Kristen said. And, you know, I wanted to just add on to that point. It's a brilliant point. Um, I love that story about the coach kind of saying no one plays pro after Canadian soccer. Um, I have, I, I, we have a picture, one of the slides of Tejon Buchanan, because in the last time we gave a talk, we were talking about how he went from playing at Syracuse University you know, and then just a couple of years later, he was playing at Club Bruges in the Champions League and then scoring for, I don't know if he scored, but he played for Canada at the World Cup. And then even now, you know, Joe's story reminds me of another example that's even closer to home is Mark Anthony Kai. And I actually remember watching him at Western when Western was playing York, right? So this is a guy who played for York University, fast forward a couple of years later, and now he's playing at the World Cup for Canada. 
right? So it's, again, so kind of just back on that theme of that, not to sound too motivational cliche, but like anything is possible, right? Like if you're willing to like work very hard and especially now with Canada and the World Cup, like there's more eyes on Canadian soccer. So it is definitely possible. So now we're going to open it up for um, small breakout discussions. And the reason I want to do this is because I feel like it's very important for people to kind of have some more intimate, you know, maybe like small groups, like let's say eight people. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and make breakout rooms. And then the goal of these breakout rooms is that there's going to be maybe, so there's Christy, Danielle, Joe, Martin, and Drayden. So five breakout rooms. And then we're going to put each of you, oh, people are leaving already. Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, um, I'll put you guys in the breakout rooms and then you guys can kind of introduce yourselves and ask questions. Okay, but people are going, maybe I'll just, I mean, it's not done yet. So maybe let me just share one more thing. Um, just some more context. Um, yeah, so in terms of next steps, um, we'll be sharing the slides and recording in the mentorship afterwards. But again, I do recommend people to stay on for the breakout session so you can like basically ask people questions and then kind of have a more closer conversation. So we'll do that for me 15 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and make the breakout rooms and then I'll, I'll assign people to rooms. Um, so let me make the breakout rooms now. Okay, so. Um, Okay, let's just do, okay, since people are leaving, maybe, maybe we just do Q&A then. That might be easier. Okay, so yeah, so we'll open up the floor for questions. So if you have any question for Christy, Danielle, Joe, Marty, or Drayden, people have any questions? You can type in the chat or unmute yourself. I have a question for Danny. Go ahead, ask it. Maybe it'd be interesting for people. What was it like playing in that huge stadium in the final in your first pro season in Australia? For the reference, you played for like one of the best teams in Australia in the top division for everyone in the audience. Yeah, it, it was nuts. It was like everything you would have dreamed of when you look to become pro or you look at these pro teams. Um, you get to walk out through the tunnel and just see thousands of people, which is, um, I think, to our grand final, we brought out the biggest crowd um, to a women's A league game that had ever been seen. There's about 10,000 people there. Um, so just being able to take that in, but also um, still staying in the moment and being able to play the game without being too distracted was um, definitely a new thing for me. But yeah, I think that's one of my one of my top memories, just starting in a grand final as my first year professionally and in front of that many people and also having like my family there as well was was super, super special. All right. So um, we got some more questions in the chat. One question was, how important is film? So open question. Anybody want to answer this one? I can take a shot at it. Um, so film from a recruiting point of view for a high school athlete who's looking to go to university, I think is important in terms of opening a door, um, establishing a relationship. I think film, my advice, and again, every coach would be different, keep it short and keep it good. Uh, no one's gonna make a decision or rarely are coaches gonna make a decision just off film. So the idea, at least from, from I think a Canadian university perspective is that <clears throat> a quick, short, impressive highlight film, make your best clips first. Uh, it gets the attention of the coach. So then they're going to look into you further and find a way to connect and, and maybe watch you in person. Well said. Um, there's a question here from Claire. Are there more scholarships opportunities in Canada or US? I can actually maybe take this one and then maybe if Jordan or someone else wants to add on, because I've done a lot of research into this. So from what I've seen, there's way more, there's a lot more scholarship opportunities in the US. It's a bigger market. There's just more people. But I also feel like there's a supply and demand thing happening at play where there are more scholarships, but there's also more people competing for these scholarships. I think um, Sosa was telling me about in UConn, right? So UConn, they have a lot of scholarships, but UConn actually hires, um, not hires, they recruit a lot of like international students. So even American kids don't even get a lot of these scholarships. It, like, it goes to like kids from like France who played for like the Ligue 1 and stuff like this. Um, so I do think there's more scholarship opportunities in the US, but there's more competition for these scholarships. 
and um, and the tuition is also more expensive. So it's not an apples to oranges comparison, but that's how I would think about it. Um, the question here is um, for Lewis. He says, I was at, at an ID camp for a BC university and was told that I would, and maybe this is a question for Joe. I think anyone can answer this, but Joe, maybe you want to take a stab at this one. I was at an ID camp for a BC university and was told that I would, I would be better off playing for a men's team rather than the BCSPL as the men's game is more compatible with the university level. Is this something you would recommend men's rather than BCSPL? Uh, so yeah, when I, the, the team I first moved out to to Vancouver to play for a couple of years ago was a club who basically does this. It's an academy that and, and men's team called the um, SV Tigers. Uh, and they essentially do exactly what the question suggests and it basically kind of bridges a gap um, between playing youth soccer bcspl and getting kids to play uh what was once be well vmsl when i first moved out here but now it's in the fraser valley soccer league so it's a men's league that happened over the winter here in bc um i think there's definitely some merit there um i think that the pace of play the athleticism the physicality is often a big step up for kids who come out of you know last year of high school they're 17 18 and all of a sudden they're playing against guys who were You've been in the gym full time, working on strength programs by head, you know, strength and conditioning coaches for three, four years now. The challenges are definitely there. Um, so I think there's some merit to that argument. Um, I do think though that it depends on the team, and I think it depends on where you where you go. Like there are some men's league teams here in BC that are, for lack of a better term, very beer leaguey, um, and so to just jump and say, well, I'm playing men's soccer, but a coach looks at that and says, okay, well, you know, like you guys trained once a week for the last year and you played games and your guys are unfit and the level and the culture isn't really that good. Um, I think that comes into it too. So I'd be very picky and choosy with what clubs I would look to jump to. Um, but in terms of, yeah, developing of the player. Yeah. I think playing as many against as many men or, you know, in this case, men and probably the same on the women's side. Um, I think that that would benefit them big time, um, just given how big that gap is to sort of to, to jump when you're 17 or 18. Um, there's another question here. Um, I'll just answer it briefly. And I know people have to go, so we'll make sure we, we finish off. I think it's, I'm not even in Toronto, so I think it's 8.30, but basically in about 10 minutes or so, just for people who are watching the time. Um, the next question here is, is LinkedIn a good platform to use to join teams and getting opportunities? I think in my personal opinion, I think any platform where you can reach other people, um, it can work. And I, the reason I say this is because for the last the last um, event we did, I was like trying to find coaches to reach out to. And I actually also use LinkedIn and I actually got some replies on there too. So I think basically anyone, any platform where people exist and they're reading messages can be used to, um, I think, get get attention. Next question here is... Um, this might actually be a good question for Danielle, Drayden, or uh, Christy, the players. How can you find out more about a team's culture slash vibe? And if you would be a right fit, if you can't, mm, this is a good question. If you can't visit it or don't know anyone on the team. Um, I can hop in, I guess, just because Queens obviously was across the country. And I don't think I actually visited until like partway through or closer to committing. I think... Honestly, if you can get the contact of a player on the team, a lot of players are willing to have a chat. Like if you just say, hey, would it be possible? Do you mind if I call? Like, I know you're studying the program that I look, I'm look, i looking into. Do you have 10 minutes if I could just ask you a couple questions? And I feel like you can get a lot um, or you can get the vibe of someone. Like for me, for example, I was lucky I got to go on my tour and meet Danny's sister. And within like five minutes, I was like, okay, she's super cool. The girls are really nice. I felt really welcomed. And same with my tour at Western, like the girls, uh, both places were really, really Really great um so I think but if you don't have the chance to physically go to a campus I feel like nowadays with social media it's pretty easy on Instagram and other ways to just quickly look someone up shoot them a message and just say hey I see that you play for Queens do you mind hopping on a call do you have 20 minutes a lot of students are willing to give back so I feel like if you're looking for a way to establish a culture without physically going across the country that might be your best bet because obviously you can chat with the coach and they'll tell you everything's good and whatnot but to chat with someone who's studying the program that you're doing and playing on the team that's that'll probably give you a pretty good indication of culture and the vibe
feel like Drayden was about to say something or Danielle. No, I, I think that she made a good point with uh, reaching out, kind of do your own due diligence to message some people. I personally, for my first school, I, I didn't do that at all. Uh, so I was just going in blind, like blindsided. Um, and it just so happened to be really good. Great culture, great team. Everything was really good. Um, <clears throat> I was personally worried about it being in the South. Uh, so I wasn't too sure. I was doing as much research as possible whatever but then when I got there like I didn't face anything um crazy at all uh so it ended up just working out but then say for example for like Texas uh before going there I had like a couple of school like since other schools were interested I was able to go for visits stuff like that so if you can get a visit in that's great and you can go for your own trip or the school will cover it yourself whatever the case but uh, a visit's definitely a good idea I don't know, Danielle, do you have anything to add or no? Uh, no, I'm on the same page as Christy. If you're able to reach out, even if it's over social media, just popping in, sending a DM, um, I think that goes a long way as well. I think that's something that I've actually done in my experience and um, ended up where I am today, so can't complain. Yeah, and you know what? This actually brings up a, a recurring theme, which I've noticed has come up in a lot in a lot of people's advice, which is just reaching out to people. I think, um, and actually maybe Aaron, you can dig out this TikTok of when I visited Queens and I found Cecilia and I just found like a bunch of students at Queens. Um, there is um, like reaching out to people is so underrated and like anywhere, like someone act about LinkedIn, like Instagram DMs are so underrated. Like you can just literally like pretty much every sports team has a men's page and a women's page for like every single sport. And then usually the players will be tagged. Like you can just DM them, tell them who you are. And then people are pretty responsive about this. Like literally Cecilia replied to a cool DM. I sent her. And then like, I think 12 hours later, we were chatting about, you know, getting her on the Tila platform to be a mentor. So just like reaching out to players for like questions. And then like, even when you've graduated from school and you want to play pro, reaching out to players about like, hey, I'm, I want to go into coaching. I'm thinking about playing pro. I'm thinking about whatever it is. Reaching out to community is like super, super underrated. I see that Aaron and Joe answered some questions in the chat. Thank you for this. Um, um, this is for Marty and Joe. Do university coaches need to see you play in person? Marty, Joe? Yeah, uh, I think I was gonna say most of the time, yes, but there are exceptions. Uh, and the exceptions would be if you have a reference that is very trusted, uh, that can reach out to a coach. I think, you know, that might be a situation where we would make a commitment with, without seeing a player in person as, as well as some video and obviously a strong CV. So I think in general, coach going to want to see you play live, but it's not always the case. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that 100%. The, the only way I think that you'd get around that, like Martin said, a combination of the, the Holy Trinity, for lack of a term, uh, a CV that really speaks for itself, uh, really good video, and then the most important would be like a really trusted reference. Um, someone who you work with day to day, not somebody who's seen you play one time, but somebody you work with day to day who the coach really trusts and has a good reputation. Um, I think that'd be with that. Uh, that I, that, I, that I could see a commitment being made without without seeing the person play live, yeah. Okay, I think we've answered most of the questions in the chat. This is pretty much the end of the session. Um, we'll send out an email afterwards with a recap of what we talked about today. Thank you so much everyone for joining. Maybe do we want to just round up with maybe like a final, just like maybe like a, a brief piece of advice you want, the most important thing you want to leave people with. Um, we can just go in a circle. We'll start with Christy. All right. I'll just say, believe in yourself and work hard. Don't estimate the power of those two things. I know people always say that and it's cliche, but I think at the end of the day, little things add up and you never know um, where you can end up, but you have to believe in yourself and continue to work even when people aren't watching. That's the biggest thing I'd say. I love it. Danny. Yeah, I'd say just be coachable and know that you will face adversity, whether it's within your sport, in your life, 
um, take that as a challenge and let it make you better. Joe? I think, I think one of the main things is obviously have goals and have aspirations, um, but don't pin your entire self-worth on whether those come to fruition necessarily or not. Like Drian talked about sending a million emails and finally one bit, but if he didn't send that email, does that mean that the work that he put in and the person that he is and the player that he is changes because one person responded to an email and 999 others did not. Um, I don't think so. Like get the value, the work and the effort and the person that you are as you try and pursue those goals. And sometimes it's a matter of luck and opportunity and a combination of a thousand other things that might lead to that opportunity actually happening for you and materializing. But don't belittle the things that you do to get yourself in a position in the first place. Well said, Marty. Yeah, I think, I think Christy said earlier, like bet on yourself. Um, but I think also that means understanding, you know, I think Danielle mentioned something about you know, getting outside your comfort zone and understanding that, you know, for you to achieve, there, there's going to be setbacks, there's going to be challenges, there's going to be obstacles and, and getting used to that and, and learning how to, you know, be resilient and overcome that as a challenge. And as the cliche says, like getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, I think is, is part of the process. And last but not least, we have Drayden's Kelly. I need to ask you about that apostrophe, but anyway, Drayden. <laughs> uh, I would say be humble, but be be very confident. Um, it's important to be humble because you, you got to recognize where you are and what your actual worth is uh, to other people, just so you can get in or, or get your foot in the door or whatever the case. Um, but uh, you also have to be confident because if you're, you're going out there and saying, hey, uh, I want a full scholarship, and you're kind of like asking, hey, can I please have it? Like, that's not really attractive to coaches. You're saying like, I am worth a full scholarship. You know what I mean? So there's there's a very diff big difference between being like cocky and confident. So you have to be humble, but then still, still be confident. I love it. Very well said. So that concludes today's um, Meet the Student Night. Um, for the speakers, if you guys want to, if are free to stay, maybe just five minutes afterwards, just to have like a recap of like how things went and just to get your thoughts. Um, if you have to go, that's fine as well. But if you guys can stay maybe five minutes um, and everyone else, enjoy the rest of your night. Have a great day.